recording. Um, so we are very pleased to have today with us Professor Michael Mike Tarr from Carnegie Mellon University. Professor Dar did his, Tarr did his P BA in Cornell University and a PhD at MIT. He is the head of the Department of Psychology at CMU. Um, um, I'm, I hope I pronounced this correctly. Ekakvi, ekak, no. Okay, Kaktich Mora, Professor of Cognitive and Brain Science, part of the Carnegie Mellon Neuroscience Institute of, um, and of the Center of Neural Basis of Cognition, and is also affiliated with the Machine Learning Department and the Robotics Institute, both in the School of Computer Science at CMU. He is the recipient of the APA Distinguished Scientific Award for an Early Career Contribution to Psychology from the American Psychological Association, a recipient of the Trolland Award from the National Academy of Sciences, was a Guggenheim Fellow, and an elected member of the American Association for the Advancements of Science. He has more than 23,000 citations and an H index of 64 according to Google Scholar. He publishes in top leading journals in the field, including Nature and Neuroscience, Trends in Cognitive Sciences, PNAS, and more. In his research, he investigates vision at various levels of processing in both natural and artificial systems, including into hard problem, looking into hard problems as the constraints necessary to build a visual system, how to better model intermediate and high level vision, the organizational principles of the visual cortex, how vision interacts with other modalities and more. And he does so by using tools drawn from cognitive science, machine learning, computer vision, computer graphics, and large scale neuroimaging from a variety of neuroimaging methods, including fMRI, MEG, and EEG. So I'd like to welcome you, Mike, to our seminar. We are delighted to have you to hear about your exciting research. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the nice introduction. It's good to see some familiar faces. Um, so let's see, let's see if the arrow key will work now. Okay, so I just wanna acknowledge all the collaborators. I've just been really lucky to have a wonderful set of colleagues um, and postdocs and graduate students that really are responsible for all of this work. Um, in particular, Leila Wahebi, who's a faculty member of machine learning, um, who's been a co-advisor on many of the students. but. One thing I'll mention is that I'm finally getting to do what I wanted to do for my PhD when I discovered that I wanted to combine artificial intelligence and biological vision and study the visual system. And it turned out that artificial intelligence didn't work very well and we didn't know much about the visual system. The tools weren't there. And I feel like after 30 years, suddenly I can do what I really wanted to do all along. So I'm having as much fun I've ever had working with all these great students and people. So it's kind of a blast. And this is going to be a sort of a whirlwind tour of some things that have happened recently. Um, just a little bit of out, a quick outline. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about background and history. Just briefly, um, I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of different projects from the past year, one on brain prediction, one on brain dissection, one called brain dive, and one called brain scuba. And then a teeny bit of philosophy as there's time at the end, but I'm just going to be really clear as I started to put this all together, I said, gosh, I want to tell people about all these things. I said, I'm not getting through this in one hour realistically, so I'm going to gloss over lots of stuff. If you have questions, fine. Um, I'm pretty going to much admit or omit most of the technical details and say, if you're interested, look at the paper and also talk to my students because honestly, they did all the technical work. There, all, every one of my PhD students is a joint student in the program for neural computation and the machine learning department, meaning they receive PhDs in both units. And so they've, you know, it's no small feat to be able to get a machine learning PhD from Carnegie Mellon given the, the, the rigor of the department and they're doing both. So they're a pretty incredible group technically. Um, okay, so piece of history. Oh, and by the way, please don't hesitate to ask questions. I won't see the hands, but Sharon, if you can just let me, me know if there's a question. Yeah, um, definitely. So one of my frustrations over the past decades that I've been working in this domain is that we mostly had small data and um, small data has some things we like about it. You know, it's well-controlled. 
Um, it's inexpensive and easy to collect. It's relatively um, straightforward from that point of view. Um, standard analyses, statistical tests work well, and you can quote, quote unquote test hypotheses easily. Um, but I never felt that particularly for the visual system, it answered a lot of the questions that we wanted. In particular, the number of stimuli you used was very poor, so you had a generalization problem, which this cartoon kind of addresses. Um, you, know, you look at grapes and melons and you extrapolate 100 meter tasty spheres. Um, you, so poor generalization, you only address the questions tested in the study. So you, you know the classic, you're only looking where the light's shining. And I think that that's been a problem for a lot of the experiments we've done in the field. And so I'm, I'm saying it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's very well suited to hypothesis confirmation as opposed to really testing because you have some sense of what conditions you're putting in and then what the likely results will be of those conditions in many cases. So, I mean, I've done a lot of it, but I've always felt that it's kind of missing a lot of the really larger challenges for the complexity of the visual system. Um, and there's this historical problem too, is our models haven't been particularly strong. Um, and there's this great variation on a quote, to substitute a bad model of the world from ill understood the world is not progress. And I've often felt particularly within the vision domain that our models are relatively simplistic and again, narrow from that point of view. And so we weren't always making progress. We were just arguing about models that we knew didn't have strong explanatory or predictive power overall. And I got really excited when I saw the first deep neural networks um, and I was like, this is it, finally, because for the first time, we really have reasonable models um, that maybe let us address the vision problem in a more serious way. And the reason why, in particular, is one, that they're built off of a scope of data and that really does represent much more of the realistic statistics of the world. There's biases, we all acknowledge that, and you know, people critique them for that. But I think overall, compared to the typical experiments we do in the way we sample the visual world, they're far better at doing a large scale sampling. And they also have this incredibly good performance. You know, They're approximating in many, many tasks the kind of level of performance that you might expect humans to do. And so rather, even if the model has issues in some sense, at least you know that it can do the task well, which I think is a good starting point for any model. Because if you have a model that's supposedly a model of a system, but the model itself doesn't do particularly well at doing that task, I have questions about how well it can be used. So, for me, it's been a very exciting time, the past decade, really, just been a game changer. Um, just a quick piece of history. This started really with ImageNet, um, which was 2009. It was really the first large-scale visual data set that was being used. Um, you know, millions of images with lots of, this, I think, 78 different categories. And it sparked a whole set of different things in computer vision. But again, the idea was it was really sampling much more densely the sort of statistics of the world. And, and ImageNet was still fairly narrow compared to what we have now. But um, that sort of got thinking more about large scale data and the realistic ability to use large scale data. Um, that inspired pretty quickly, really, a set of larger scale neural data sets, realization that you could do the same kind of thing in vision in certain ways. And so one of them was the one we collected in the lab. Bold 5000, which is public available. You can go to bold5000.org. It's a collection of four individuals that looked at 5,000 pictures while being scanned in an fMRI scanner. And then there's also some localizers and other scans as well. Um, and the idea is we were trying to do a much better job capturing the statistics of the world in terms of the kinds of things people saw. So they saw either natural scenes that had complex interactions between people and objects from something called the COCO data set. Um, the, or they saw natural scenes that didn't have people in them from the sun data set, but so more like scenic things or kitchens or rooms, or they saw objects from ImageNet, which tended to be more single objects against background, fairly simple backgrounds. So we tried to give some breath in there. Um, then following up on that, Kendra K has developed the natural scenes data set, which has been a real boon, as we'll see, which was even bigger. It's about 10,000 images per an individual. There's eight individuals. Um, and there they use only cocoa images, which are these more natural scenes of people typically interacting or um, scenes of the world. Um, these have allowed us to expand the kinds of um, amount of data we have. The observations for the part participant are much larger. Um, you know, we've increased power by the number of observations across these individual participants. 
There's an also there's a methodology thing which I'll just allude to very briefly at one point, which is that Kendrick in particular developed some techniques which really improve the SNR of the data sets. So it's really useful. And again, it's publicly available from that point of view. And we've learned more since that um, about what we can do to improve these large scale data sets. But they're comprehensive. They capture a wider range of visual domains and conceivably tasks. So it's really exciting from that point of view. Um, just briefly think about the NSD data set, Kendrick's data set, eight participants at 73,000 unique cocoa images. You can see some examples of cocoa images there. Um, you have three repeats per an image, which turns out to be really important. If you do one repeat, if you only show an image once, you don't get a good stable estimate of the signal. Three repeats, as it turns out, is plenty. It stabilizes by three, you get a very good estimate. Um, it has very high SNR. Um, it has some ROI annotations as well. One of the reasons that is high SNR is because he used a 7T scanner. But the other reason is a set of, a new processing pipeline he developed, which we then worked with him to develop into an open source package called ELM Single that you can now download. So if you're doing fMRI data and you're doing some repeats per condition, I encourage you to look at ELM Single because we reapplied it, for instance, to the Bold 5000 data set and increase the SNR of the data set by a factor of two. So it's one of these rare cases where it's something for nothing. Um, it's just a better model for how you end up pre-processing your fMRI data that actually increases signal because there is more there and it's just a matter of thinking about it from a signal processing point of view. Um, so that's just a little bit about the natural scenes data set. Um, just one more brief piece of background. All of the work I'm going to be talking about, or almost all the work I'm going to be talking about, uses something called an encoding model, which are built on these new models within AI, these neural networks. Um, essentially, you have an input space and you have a mapping between, in this case, it doesn't have to be images, it could be anything, but images and fMRI brain responses. And that leads to this activity space of the vox voxel by voxel neural responses over all of the images. Um, you have the same kind of input space where which you're training a model, and it's a nonlinear model, typically a deep neural network, um, and you're building a feature representation by it learning to do, learning to represent that input space. It could be images, it could be, you know, at the object level, it could be individual low-level features, anything. And then you're doing a linear mapping between the feature space that you've built and the activity space, your fMRI data. And from that, you're trying to do some kind of prediction. Typically, you're measuring correlation R squared as a measure of how well you're able to predict individual voxel activations based on the feature space that you um, learned in the model. The one thing actually that's a little deceiving here is um, to be careful, you never train the model on any of the images that were used to generate your fMRI data. Those are completely separable. So these kinds of encoding models, the Nestle-Eras paper is a wonderful paper. If you're curious about them, um, are essentially what we're going to be using in almost all of the work I'm going to be talking about in some form or another. And so the, the key is there is this deep neural network. Um, how do I get, oops, uh, get the pointer up. There we go, laser pointer. You can all see that? Good. So yeah, yes. so this deep neural network is embedded in there. Great. Okay, just quickly also, um, this is often the view of the um, brain that you see, um, but is the animation gonna work? There we go. Most of the data I'm gonna show for brain data is going to be in terms of these cortical flat maps, which not everyone's all familiar with. So you can just see the transformation that occurred there. And um, there's a package out of Jack Gallon's lab called PyCortex. It's a very good package for turning a sort of more typical MNI representation of the brain into these kind of flat maps. So you can see the whole cortical surface. A lot of people are familiar with it now, but I thought I'd mention it. Okay. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is a fairly straightforward brain prediction model, the kind of encoding model I talked about. But the really unique part of it here that makes it different from a lot of the other brain prediction models you may have seen that have been published over the years, starting with Danny Amon's work with Kim DiCarlo, is we're using a model called CLIP, which stands for Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training. Um, what that really means is that CLIP learns a joint representation between two things, complex images, okay, things in a scene of some sort, and captions of those images. 
So instead of ever learning just about the images and doing some task where it's labeling, for instance, the content of the image in terms of the object, it's actually learning to align a, rep a single representation space between captions of images to describe complex actions in, lang in language, sometimes a full long sentence, and what the complex image itself is. So it's a much more sort of, I guess, psychologically realistic kind of approach in terms of the fact that you're representing two sources of information, the semantics of the scene, what's happening, what's what it contains, as well as the actual image content of the scene. Um, so similar kind of approach to what I just talked about, um, encoding model. Again, you've got two things going on. You've got these complex images and you've got these captions. So here the captions might be two double decker boxes on a city street, some pastries and iced coffee sitting on a table in a cafe, or a baby and two adult giraffes outside in a field. And Clip allows you to learn both of those two, the, both of those representations. You have an image encoder, you have a text encoder. Because of the way does Clip does contrastive learning, it learns a joint representation in terms of the representation of the images and the um, text. And then what you do is you do the same kind of thing that I've described, you predict the brain data directly. And we're gonna be using NSD for this, um, predicting the voxel responses of NSD to looking at complex first pictures. So just pause before I show you the data. Is everyone clear on sort of the game we're playing here? Any questions? Okay, and the, and the sort of scientific question here is, do we do a better job if we have a good semantic description learn jointly with the images and the images alone, with the idea being that high level visual representation may be a combination really of the semantics and how we understand the world as well as just the bottom up visual input. And that the two things together may provide a better description of how we code information than images alone. Um, so here's some um, data, again, a flat map here with some of the um, major regions of interest marked. We've got R squared performance. And so this is the whole cortical surface. And this is how well the CLIP image encoder, which again is a jointly learned model that's affected by the semantics of the captions as well, is doing in terms of predicting the neural data in NSD. Um, what you can see immediately is if you look at the R squared values, they're remarkably high. They get up into the 0.7 range. This isn't even R, this is R squared. It's an incredibly high number. Remember, this is responses, neural responses for individual voxels for someone looking at 10,000 different pictures and reliably being able to predict not an average, but the response to each of the individual pictures with a correlation of 0 0.7, 0 0.7. That's a really high number. I mean, that's a lot of the variance explained in terms of what's happening in the visual system. And in particular, the places we see our strongest responses, the best prediction, aren't even early vision. So it's not like it's just capturing statistics of images per se. It's really in these higher level visual areas we think of as being semantically grounded. Things like the extra striate body area, the fusiform face area, the perihippocampal place area, RSC, and so on. So striking, doing really well, okay? Um, so that's telling us something already that the performance is so good. Um, and in fact, if you look at it relative to the noise ceiling, um, when we estimate how well you can do relative to the amount of noise that's actually in the neural data, we're doing even better. We're up in the 0.9 range. So the dashed line there is a 0.85% noise ceiling, um, and the red line is the theoretically perfect noise ceiling, and we're approaching for a lot of these highest predicted voxels, actually the best that you could possibly do. I mean, essentially, given the measurement technique, this clip model is almost, is I don't want to say perfectly, but doing extraordinarily well at predicting the actual neural data. And remember, the CLIP model didn't know anything about neurons or brains at all. All it did was try to build a good representation for a task that aligns captions and descriptions of the world human generated with pictures. And it comes up with a representation when you do that that actually does seem to capture a lot of the neural representation of information when looking at complex scenes. So that's pretty striking to us. Um, one of the things that's interesting is remember the clip model is a joint model learning captions and pictures. And so the representations, even when the, when the text encoder are affected by the pictures, okay, although it's more biased towards the captions. And even there, what you can see is that the text encoder alone does a very good job predicting some of these higher level areas. So we really think that what's happening is a lot of higher level vision areas, it's not really vision anymore, it's really semantics rounded by vision. 
but it's a combination of the two. And so whatever's being captured there in terms of the representations and the way we were, we're responding, that even a model that's capturing those semantics more in a text-based kind of way, but is influenced by the visual similarity and structure, ends up doing a pretty good job. So that's striking in itself too. Um, okay. Um, now, what I've drawn here is, if you look, let's get the pointer up. Um, there's, you can do a comparison. So we can do some controls here to try and understand what's going on about why CLIP is doing so well. And so you can do a comparison between the CLIP representations where you've got the jointly learned model between the language and the visual representations and a version of a visual network, in this case, ImageNet trained ResNet, which is identical in architecture to the clip part of the image representation, except it's no longer doing a joint representation with the captions, it's just learning a bottom-up representation of visual information. So the architecture of the model here is the same, but the task is purely just to label pictures rather than do an aligned representation with the semantics as captured by the captions. And then you can conversely do the same for the text encoder. You have your clip text encoder, which was jointly learned across um, language and vision. And you can compare that to a very high performing large language model, in this case, BERT, which uses the same basic architecture as a clip text encoder, except it no longer does a joint learning between the images and the pictures. So you can look at the role of learning pictures alone or learning language alone and see how well it does compared to learning the joint representation between the two. Does everyone understand that? Okay. Um, so why? Okay, yeah. So this is just the image results. Okay, so this is a um, this is a unique variance accounted for from ResNet clip. Again, the jointly learned representation between between semantics and visual information versus just a purely visual representation. So all the areas in blue, more variance is accounted for by the purely visual representation, and more. Um, variance in the pink is accounted for by the joint representation that includes semantics. And what you can see here is that early vision actually is better captured by a purely bottom-up model that only learns about visual stuff. Okay. Um, on the other hand, almost all the higher level areas are much, much better captured by something that includes the language. So we can say right away that the prediction we're seeing clip the high performance isn't something else about the model per se. It's really about the joint space that's learned between the semantics and between the visual representation. The fact that early vision is actually captured purely by a bottom-up model better does tell us in some sense that there are clearly, which we should know and remember that there are multiple stages to the visual system. Some of them are probably locked down over evolution to capture statistics of the world independent of higher level knowledge, which would make sense for early vision. Okay, now we can do the opposite. Oh, by the way, this is consistent across subjects. So this is just three different subjects and you can see the same thing, unique variance accounted for by the semantics plus vision model is much better than the vision alone model. Um, okay. Um, and we can show also he just quantitatively that ResNet clip, again, the joint model does much better than ResNet ImageNet in every case way outperforms in terms of both model performance prediction and in terms of unique variance accounted for. So really, really, it's just much better when you include the semantics. Okay, now we can do the same thing for the text. Just look at the text encoder versus um, a purely text-based system that has no visual um, alignment at all. And what you can see here is that essentially through the entire visual system, the text encoder alone captures almost nothing about the responses in the visual system. All of the cases are, in all the cases, the unique variance is much better accounted for in the blue, which is the, the clip text encoder where you've got the joint representation. So it's clearly a visually grounded representation, but the semantics seem to matter in some way. But sort of any semantics alone expected from text doesn't really count for much variance at all. So we're pretty assured that this joint model is really what's going on. Um, again, consistency across participants. Okay, um, one of the things you wanna say then is, well, what's going on? What's represented here? Like, what are the important parts of semantics that are extracted from the captions that allow you to do so much better than vision alone? Okay, and so one of the things we did is we did a PCA. Um, we did actually a lot of PCAs. I'm gonna just show you a couple really interesting ones on the, um, images with the lowest scores, images with the highest scores on a given PC dimension, and we're gonna plot those out. 
So you're going to have different PC, PC dimensions, principal components, and we're going to look for one images that vary across that dimension that have higher low scores, which really gives you the dimensionality of a particular PCA or principal component. So this is PC1 um, for the clip prediction data. And this is this particular axis here, I'm sort of labeling it, looks like it's inanimate versus animate. So what you've got is on one side of the PC, the lowest scores, you've got inanimate places, scenes, things that don't have any people or animals in them of any sort, nothing really going on. And then on the other end of that same PC, this is the first component, you've got people doing stuff. Um, very striking. So it seems to be an important dimension in the representational space that's being captured by the prediction of clip is this difference between things with people and things going on versus nothing going on. Another particularly interesting one is PC5, which is also still highly significant. Um, crowds of people versus individual people doing things. In this case, um, Ari insisted it was doing sports. I think that was an artifact of the way NSD collected its data, that there was lots and lots of pictures of individuals doing sports and not that many individuals doing much else. So it looks like it's doing sports, but I think it's really just individuals versus crowds. Um, this is a really interesting one because we see a lot of this kind of sensitivity to individuals versus groups of people and also people versus no people at all in the coding, not only within the clip prediction and the PCAs we found um, looking at it, but there's another paper that I'm not going to talk about today on looking at food representation and then coding of food in the brain. And we found that there was a strong interaction between people eating alone and people eating together in groups in terms of segregation within the neural representation of food. And one of the ideas we've been coming up with that we need to explore more that we're pursuing is that there really is some kind of interdigitating between the representations of things like EBA that represents people, essentially bodies, and FFA, which also represents people, and other representations, for instance, action representations or food representations and even place representations. And really what's going on is that there's a sort of network of processes that are less about areas and more about the anchoring of how people interact in the world, either socially or in interacting with other kinds of objects and whether or not it's a large social group, a small social group, and then how things are happening. So Mel, I assume you'd resonate highly to that kind of idea. Um, so just really interesting. This is There's a lot more PCAs in terms of looking at the underlying representations captured by CLIP. Um, one of the things we can say is that if we look at which regions benefited the most from CLIP, where we got the highest benefit for CLIP over an image-only representation, the representations that seem to be best captured in the voxels that were most, be most benefiting from this kind of joint representation were ones that were, again, humans interacting with their environment. So it seems to be something about semantics captures actions, social information, and in ways that aren't captured well by an image-only model. And of course, there's a lot of social inference and um, semantics and people interacting that needs to be inferred. Um, okay, last point about this um, project, just going through it very quickly, there's a lot more in the paper. Um, is we wanted to understand also what were the factors that really drove us to have such good prediction performance. Because CLIP is a bit unique, particularly for the time, it's already a couple years old, but CLIP is unique in a multiple different ways. One is the natural language feedback, the captions, which I've already emphasized a lot. But also from a data set size, at the time it was probably one of the largest trained models out there. It used 400 million different images and captions which is really big. It's amazingly, it's not so big now, but at the time it was the biggest. And it also compared to a lot of other data sets that seemed to be a lot more diverse in the kinds of pictures that it used. And so we wanted to try and understand isolation of those different factors. So we built then a set of different models. Um, um, so in one case, we used a language only model. It's a slightly different from CLIP. It's an open source model, language only model. Um, called SSL, and then, um, sorry, I've got it backwards. We used a vision-only model, SSL, um, and then we used a, a version of it um, that also included language. And you can, this is an open source model that you can use where you can have vision or you can have vision plus language. So we're comparing here um, 
the performance of a vision only model to a vision model plus language model where everything else is controlled for in every way. And you can see that there's some areas that are better predicted by the language plus vision, which is the blue regions. But again, early visual areas are sort of better predicted by the vision only model. Similar to what we found before, but this is a better controlled comparison. The architecture is identical in every way. Um, but then we did another comparison. So we used um, essentially the same models, but now we compared 400 million examples in training to 2 billion examples in training. And one of the ideas is the data set size matter a lot. And what we actually found is given the same model architecture, given the same task, 400 million versus 2 billion doesn't matter much at all. There's slight differences in prediction, but very, very few. And so in terms of the variance accounted for and what we were seeing, it looks like at least when you get up to the point of 400 million, adding more images in, and more examples, in doesn't really matter very much. And there's actually some computer vision findings that are similarly, that there's sort of a asymptote on training, where once you get to a certain level of training set size, probably in the hundreds of millions, it doesn't seem to matter that much. Um, and then the last comparison we're doing here is about data set diversity. So we controlled for the number of examples. In this case, I believe it was um, about 400 million but we use two different data sets. We use the original Clip data set, which comes from OpenAI, by the way, the same people that gave us ChatGPT. In effect, Clip is hiding behind ChatGPT. ChatGPT uses Clip as one of its pieces of intelligence. Um, but OpenAI's original 400 million data set versus 400 million images sampled from an open source data set called Lion, which is known to be very diverse and was sort of built to be diverse. And what we find actually is that while early visual areas seem to be captured better by OpenAI's data set for some reason, we're not completely sure why, the higher level prediction performance we see in EBA, FFA, and some of those areas seems to actually be enhanced more by having a divert, more diverse data set, the Leon data set. So one of the things we conclude from all of this is that language matters a lot in terms of language feedback, the current representation that we hypothesize. Data set size doesn't seem to matter over a certain amount. And that data set diversity does matter a lot. And it's something we need to think about when we're designing both models, but also, of course, if we're trying to build a new neural data set like the next NSD, we have to worry a lot about diversity if we want to do a good job in generalization. Okay. So takeaways from this, the clip model, this multimodal vision plus language model was that certainly these task optimized networks seem to help us do a better job understanding how the brain's processing natural vision and semantics together. We're learning something about the representations in terms of what kind of information is encoded and the fact that it does include semantics. And again, we improve the prediction of high level visual um, cortical, cortical perform, um, prediction performance by adding in the natural language supervision. And we're beginning to get more at fine grained semantics um, in the particularly in the PCA work, trying to understand what kinds of underlying dimensions are critical in the neural encoding of visual information. Um, that's really gonna be the focus of the rest of this talk is how we begin to build tools for doing an even better job looking at fine-grained visual representation. Okay, um, I'll pause. Any questions at this point? Um, I have a few questions, but I'm gonna leave them till the end. Um... Okay. Great. I know. Let I'm me ask you. Sure. Let me ask you a question. Till now, you've spoken about visual areas rather than uh, uh, more focused voxels, or not? <laughs> yeah, I'm really. We're predicting at the voxel basis, but pretty much it'd be hard to make any claims about individual voxels. Um, we're really. Um, mostly trying to characterize area. And we do see, one of the nice things, by the way, is these voxels are all predicted independently, but within a given region, you do see a lot of consistency in prediction performance, or if you do the PCAs, looking at the, which components are critical. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of what I would call peppering of the voxels having very different functional responses locally which actually sort of re reaffirms that there is some kind of larger scale functional organization happening in visual cortex probably. Although I'm not a big fan of like areas, choir areas as being like these domain specific kinds of things. That's not really what yeah. I'm trying to argue for, but there's there's localization of function, at least in some kind of gradient that changes over the course of cortex. 
Right. So, and that the cortex, the visual cortex is divided into some sort of categories of images. And those categories are reflected in the cortex as well as they are in uh, the way uh, Clip uh, uh, says what's in the picture. Well, so I don't, this whole issue of representing categories is sort of one that's become more fraught. Yeah. And I guess right. the way I like to think about it is it's less about categories as categories and more about what are the ecologically most important kinds of things for us to learn and be able to reason about visually and semantically. And those end up surfacing <clears throat> certain kinds of information like faces or bodies or objects for action or food or places because we have to do things like socialize and navigate and eat and recognize kind of specifics but not because the categories themselves are somehow instantiated as categories, but those just end up being the kinds of things that we need our visual system to be able to learn about. So it's probably built to be able to learn those kinds of networks and support them. Um, and obviously there's some specialization to be able to do those tasks well, but I don't, going back to you know my work with Isabel Goki, I don't think it's about the category itself. It's just that it's optimized to be able to support those kinds of ecologically important sources of information and things we need to do with the world. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, if you're curious, a lot of these minion pictures are generated by um, a generative AI program. They're not actually drawn by any human being. Uh, I just tell it what I want and it gives me them, um, which we're gonna get to in a second in a very direct kind of way. Um, all right. so. I'm going to talk now about three different projects that are all meant to begin to build tools for doing a better job articulating something about the fine-grained representations and information encoded in visual cortex. So the first one I'm going to talk about briefly is called brain dissection. And the goal is to take optimized artificial neural networks and uncover a sort of spatial feature or selectivity across the visual cortex. In this case, very much on a voxel by voxel basis. And it's built off of this idea of interpretable artificial neural networks by a guy named David Bao. He called it network dissection. And it was a way for him to be able to understand what different units within an artificial neural network were actually coding for in terms of the visual information that they had been trained on. And then my colleague, Leilo Ahebi, and a um, postdoc of hers, Minakshi Kosla, suggested that you could actually align the artificial neural networks using an encoding model that we already talked about, similar kind of the way the CLIP approach was done, um, with um, brain data, and then use the interpretability of the artificial network that had been aligned with the brain data to learn more about what the brain data was coding for at each individual voxel level because of that alignment. And they showed at a very coarse level that it worked well in terms of that you could, for instance, show that the fusiform face area, when you had a network that predicted the fusiform face area well, that you can interpret and find that category selectivity and face, face representation in the neural network. So it was interpretable in that way, but they didn't use it to do any fine grained analysis. And then my student Gabe Sarch and his co-advisor Katerina looked at this and realized that you could use it in a much more fine grained way to begin to make, um, for, well, not really prediction, you can do interpretable understanding of what kinds of features were coded at the voxel level within the brain for what we think of as more specific visual features rather than the category level. And one of the key things about this is it's a, a hypothesis neutral model. Um, so the hypothesis essentially is the vocabulary of features that David Bao built into his original network dissection paper, which is a vocabulary of, I think, 3,000 different kinds of visual features that were learned from images. And so it's really very agnostic in terms of what could come out in terms of um, interpretability of different voxel coding. So the basic pipeline, which is fairly complicated, and I'm not going to get into details, but again, it's this hypothesis neutral approach. You're predicting specific voxels, and you're training a convolution neural network to predict the voxel responses to natural images. Um, again, I, just as the kind of encoding model we were talking about before. But instead of worrying so much about its prediction performance, although it is high in the end, um, which is why the network it does extract good image features for predicting each box so well, what you're doing instead is you're taking that network and you're using this network dissection technique 
You're taking held out images that weren't seen by the network before, and you're extracting regions within a network that it considers most relevant for each voxel in terms of those new images that you've put in. And you're able to analyze the voxel property, um, voxel selective regions within the images themselves in terms of what features are present within the images using standard computer vision techniques, which I think yeah, is right here, standard computer vision techniques to look what kinds of features are actually um, best characterizing the response of individual voxels in the brain. So you have this pipeline in which you're building a prediction model, then you're using uh, the neural net network dissection technique to look at that prediction model's coding of features, and then you're putting them back into the image and you're trying to understand what particular features were most relevant for each voxel response. And so some of the features we're talking about here um, that we used in this particular paper that seemed to, we could do a good job characterizing were depth, surface normals, 3D curvature, shading, and then we did some things with category category relations. Um, but there's a much wider vocabulary that were in the original model, and you can actually build in new ones if you wanted as well. Like you can build in much higher order ones than we used for this particular paper. Um, these are the regions of interest we happen to be looking at here. Um, we just, for computational reasons and interpretability reasons, we just focused on these particular regions of the visual cortex. So you can see them here. Um, there's some category selective ones and just no anatomical. Um, the particular things, again, we looked at were the depth information, so metric depth, so that's just how far away things were in meters, estimated, again, from a computer vision model. In the images, relative depth, the depth maps normalized a range of zero to one. Surface normals, that is the surface orientation, is it relative to the observer, is it relative to the ground plane somewhere else? Shading, the lightness and depth, the shape from shading kinds of cues that might be present. Gaussian curvature, which gives you some estimate of um, how much 3D curvature there in the, is in the, um, the images. This is similar to the kind of work Ed Connor had done years ago in physiology. And we're using a couple of computer vision models to estimate the depth in the images in various ways. Um, and, try, and at this point, the computer vision models do a good job estimating the, the, that information in the images. So what do you get out of this? Well, first of all, we can show that the actual estimates that we get really outperform previous models very well in terms of predicting neural data. So the Les Crowe and Gallant paper, um, you can see the level of prediction they were doing um, for um, um, predicting different low-level features. Our model is able to do a much better job. So their model there are quantitatively speaking in different regions, PPA, OPA, and RSC, their, the blue bar, their prediction performance, or their correlation performance is about 0.2. Um, we're up in about the 0.4 range, two different versions of the model, one that's a convolution neural network, one that's using a transformer. Um, and then for comparison, you could also do something where you just take a model that's optimized to just predict the neural data itself rather than be interpretable in terms of the kinds of features. So it's actually not hypothesis neutral. It's actually meant to just predict the brain data. And we're doing about as well as that. Um, so we're pretty sure that we're doing a pretty good job understanding some of the kinds of features that are encoded in these parts of the visual cortex. Um, so what do we learn? Um, so we've got a couple of highlights here, and I understand this is a fairly complicated picture. Um, what I'd like to focus on, there's, you know, there's a, there's a map of metric depth. And one of the things you can see here is this map of metric depth. When you zoom in, um, is actually fairly organized. Again, we're doing a voxel by voxel prediction, but you see very distinct clustering of metric depth distances that are um, differentiated from one another across visual cortex. So it's, it's like there is a map within visual cortex of um, very different depths is, is elicited by the scenes um, that's capturing information about how far or close away things are relative to the observer um, in an organized sort of way. These didn't necessarily have to be organized. And this is one of the regions where we see some of the um, most fine grained representation that seems to be separable in different ways. If you look at a lot of visual cortex down here, it's fairly similar. But then again, if you zoom in on this bottom box here, again, you see that you've got this nice map of metric depth, the gradient. It's as if it's representing metric depth in the gradient kind of way. Um, if we go to surface normals, we saw something really interesting. It's a little hard to see on here. But what we saw is there was a large progression of surface normals that seemed to be out towards the world as if they were egocentric. 
in terms of representing visual information relative to the observer. And then in one small region, but organized again, not just single voxels, a whole group of them, suddenly all the surface normal shifted to being relative to the ground plane. So it's as if it shifted from an egocentric representation to an allocentric representation, which make, makes complete sense in terms of how the visual system might code information, particularly in scene areas, that you have a representation not only of how things look relative to you, but some kind of independent representation of how everything is relative to the world, independent of the observer. And this is, this is just a hint of that kind of thing, but the idea of what you might be able to do with this kind of approach is you can see this one region, if you can see the pointer here, that really represents everything relative to the ground plane quite strongly and separately for the other regions that are relative to the observer. So that's interesting. We also see organized information about Gaussian curvature and shading, um, less interpretable than any kind of high level theory at this point, but it seems to be quite organized as if the visual system is representing this information sort of almost overlaid with all the other kind of semantic and high level information that's encoded. Okay. Um, um, can yes, I ask you a question? Yeah, because yeah. I mean, it, it just blew me away to see all this, uh, you know, order and, mm -hmm. um, and and also, you know, the resemblance to retinotopic mapping. I mean, eccentricity-based mm -hmm. maps. I mean, if I look at the, let's say, the depth, right. it looks like, you know, the center, let's say, mid-periphery is mm -hmm. more bluish. And, you right. know, as you get further away, I mean, it exactly. just looks like some eccentricity map. I mean, not of low-level, uh, you know, early visual cortex, but high-level visual cortex seems to be following some center periphery organization with respect to depth, which is... Well, that, and that, that may be, I mean, uh, I'm not someone who's thought a lot about depth representation over the years, but that's a good point that I think that um, what could be happening is that you've got this very strong sort of near representation centrally, and then as you go further away, you're representing things from a further distance in the periphery, which wouldn't be a crazy thing to imagine in terms of how we instantiate information. It would almost wouldn't make sense to represent near information um, with, the, with the peripheral signals. They're almost always going to be necessarily further away and then also they're going to be blurred. So representing near stuff wouldn't be particularly useful. I, is that sort of get it, what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, it's it's really it's a new way to look at the visual cortex organization, and it's just exposing you know dimensions that were not known before. Let's say so. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, and the the consistent organization is is really yeah. Okay, I'll 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 think more about so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I hundred percent. I, I mean, when Gabe showed me this, I was like blown away too. I was like, whoa. Like I expected him to get back a bunch of noise. And, like, and I think really what I'm excited about is this first study was great to do, but it was really just a placeholder for the idea that we could use this technique in the long run with much richer data sets to really begin to learn things and the tool can be incredibly valuable. So it's really what we might be able to do with it and the whole field could do with it more than what we've learned at this point even. Um, we're, I, I feel like we're just getting started. It's a whole new way to try and approach it. And again, the vocabulary is unlimited. You could actually build in lots of higher order features. And now we're, I'll mention at the end, but we're going to start to do things with movies. We're going to build in dynamic features. And you could look to see whether dynamics are coded in particular ways within the visual system, other than the obvious places like MT or whatever. There might be other information encoded about action that we've just missed because there was no way to actually explore that carefully. So it's, it's really sort of an open-ended toolbox and I'm hopeful it will become really more valuable over time. Lovely, so, thank you. Um, you're welcome. So just um, summarizing a little bit, we saw that ventral lateral regions exhibited a preference for closer depths. As you said, um, predominantly horizontal surface normals, curvier 3D surfaces and lighter shading. So it sort of seems to be some kind of segregation between foreground and object processing. Um, the medial and prior areas showed the opposite preferences with more complex, complex variability in depth and surface normal selectivity, flatter 3D surfaces. Um, Gabe has this idea that he's been arguing with me that parietal regions stood out. He thought the selectivity in them seems to code things like on or near. He thinks there's almost a kind of qualitative spatial coding going on there to be determined. Um, RSC preferred greater depth. Again, these kind of outdoor object categories, attribute simulations. 
Um, again, consistent with the idea of RFC as being part of a representation of the physical world for more landmark and outdoor scene processing. Um, OPA um, was more proximate depths, so the scene network does seem to be segregating in some way in terms of indoor scene versus outdoor scene. Um, and PPA sort of in between. Okay, um, how long do you, do you typically just go an hour? Unmute yourself. Uh, so you, it's it, all up to you. I mean, you can, uh, we're flexible. Um, okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to get through a couple other things quickly. There, I, I can gloss over a lot of technical details. They're a little bit more cool than they are real big new results, but let's try and get through. And this is the brain yeah. dive and brain sure. scuba. Okay, um, so that's brain dissection. And again, I think as a toolkit, I'm very excited. And again, it's bi-directionally leveraging. You're aligning models with the brain and then you're taking the brain and sort of essentially aligning it back with the model and using the model as a tool for exploring what the brain was coding. Um, okay, brain dive. Um, this is a, another amazing student, Andrew, and an amazing postdoc, Maggie Henderson. Um, so brain dive, the goal here is to do something completely different, which is synthesize the most exciting images or the best images that are likely to activate a given brainy um, region. And I just wanna be clear, this is different from decoding. You've probably seen a lot of pictures and papers that show, oh, this is the image that the brain seemed to be responding to, but they're mostly doing decoding where they're reconstructing essentially the visual stimulus that they think for a single brain activation gave rise to that brain activation. Here, what we're doing is we're trying to understand the selectivity of different regions. So we're generating novel images. There's no attempt to say that this is what the brain actually saw at the time. What the attempt is to do is say, these are the images most likely to give rise to the set of neural responses across the whole brain region um, that would be likely to generate that level of response. Okay. And what we're using is something called a diffusion model, which I'll talk about in a second, but we're generating the images from scratch um, and they're positive to be the most optimal images. Um, and again, not the ones people saw. And again, we're optimizing over thousands of responses. It's not for a single response to the brain data. It's like we're giving it, in the NSD case, we might be giving it, we're giving it all 10,000 responses in a given brain region for all 10,000 pictures people saw in NSD. And we're saying, what is the optimal images that we can learn given that people saw 10,000 images and this is the brain response we got in this particular part of the brain, okay? Um, so in some sense, you can say, well, that's never going to work because it's so blurry because you've showed so many different kinds of images. How can any individual brain area give up some signal that we can learn something? So in some sense, we're just going to see if it works. Like I wasn't sure this was going to work at all. Um, just to be clear, you might have heard about GAN models, general adversarial neural networks that were used to generate images earlier in AI. And then more recently, I don't know how many of you ever played with stable diffusion or Dolly. These are diffusion models. They're... Um, these latent diffusion models are trained on 2 billion images. For instance, in the stable diffusion case, they've learned this latent representation of image space very, very densely. And then they're using this noise generation model to essentially from noise generate a new um, image based on some kind of driver. The typical driver is a prompt where you say, give me of a picture of a nice scene with mountains in the background and green fields in the front, and you get the picture in the middle there, or give me a you know, generate a picture of tropical fish swimming in the ocean, and it moves through that image space, and it does this denoising process, which I don't completely understand myself, to be completely honest, from the slave in space, to generate a new image that's never before been seen. And that's how, like, I get these minion images, or you can play with Dolly, and I use it to illustrate all of my lectures for my classes now. I just tell it what I want my pictures to be, and it gives me great entertaining pictures. So, um, they're quite remarkable. Again, they're completely unbiased, except for the fact that they learned only 2 billion images. So whatever the content of those 2 billion images, it biases the latent image space, but it's pretty rich. Okay, um, so that's the diffusion model we're using. And the basic process we're using is, um, we have two components. We have the diffusion model, and we have an image computable brain encoder again. In this case, we're using um, a version of CLIP again. And so we have a brain encoder again building a representation feature space between images and neural responses. But now what we're doing is we're taking that brain representation 
The features of the brain over the, that were learned in the neural responses for over the 10,000 pictures that each individual subject saw, and we're feeding that to the stable diffusion model, and we're telling the stable diffusion model, instead of having a text prompt, it's using these brain, these neural responses to generate an image. So you're getting an image from stable diffusion based on the neural responses directly. There's no captioning involved or anything. It's just telling, you're saying, this is the set of neural responses. What do you think the best image is given? It's just data to the model. It doesn't know it's brain data or it's a caption at all. And it's just saying, this is figure out the best image that would give rise to that set of data. Okay. Um, so here we go. Um, if we give it a set of face regions, the top, the left four images, those are images generated with stable diffusion. They weren't images that were ever existed in the world. Um, if you give it place regions, you get those four images there. If you give it body regions as your neural responses, again, you're just selecting neural responses from your large set of NSD data for a given region, you get bodies back. If you give it word regions, you get things that look like text, but aren't interpretable text. And the coolest one for us, was, you remember, I alluded to, we had done this paper where we found, um, and several other groups had done too, had found evidence for a food food selective region of the brain. If we gave that visual, visual cortical responses for the food selective region that we thought was food selective, you get back images that look like this. So they look like food, but not food that you ever saw before. And it's actually a little freaky because it's like definitely food, but it's like, why is it food? Like what makes it food? It's a little hard to say a little harder than um, some of the other regions. Okay, so it seems to work really well. Um, we wanted to validate it. Um, just quickly, um, we did it for a set of different semantic categories. We compared it to the original kinds of images used to localize those categories. Um, we've done things like we targeted different face selective regions to look at fine grain coding. And We've also looked at the distribution of selectivity within the same ROI. What's the fine coding within a single ROI as opposed to two different ROIs? So I'm going to go through this really quickly. Just these are images that were used in NSD that seem to do a good job driving either place voxels, word voxels, face voxels, body voxels, or food voxels. So these are actual images from NSD Coco images. And then here, this is, for instance, generated images from brain dives for um, place voxels. So this is voxel by voxel now. Um, you can see that we're generating images that look like places. Um, you can see for the words, it's okay, it's not great. Words are the most challenging. Um, face voxels, you get lots of faces. If you do body voxels, you get lots of bodies, but with heads too, which I think is an important point. I'm not sure that EBA and FFA should be so separable from each other, since heads typically and faces appear on bodies. And then if you do it for food voxels, here's what you get. You get beautiful food back. Again, looks like food. We're not sure what it is exactly. But so we do a really good job sort of duplicating the level of um, complexity of the original kinds of images that were used to generate the data. Again, we're not trying to reconstruct them at all, just using them as a driver. So it seems like a really interesting tool. Um, just to quickly show you some of the things you can do with it. So here's individual two individual subjects. Here's NSD data for two different um, ROIs, the FFA and the OFA, occipital face region and fusiform face area. Um, these are actual NSD images that drove them. Here's the images we get back from rain diffusion. So you can see that it actually does a really good job um, partitioning OFA and FFA into different kinds of facial features. The FFA is much more coherent, full facial faces. We can see it's for subject five as well, whereas the OFA seems to be like face parts in some kind of way, but really you can see a face in it, but it's clearly not a face at the same level as the higher level region is. So it re, so in this case, it reinforces things we believe to be true about OFA versus FFA. Um, and then just if you look within different clusters quickly, we've got um, the, um, we can cluster the data um, in terms of the prediction model, the feature space, um, in terms of different um, voxels that seem to cluster together. And then we can see what kinds of images are generated. So we did that for OPA. And if you look at OPA, the actual NSD images, these are actual images that drove the two clusters separately. And they seem to have some different characteristics, but not entirely, but in some sense, the um, brain dive approach actually pulls them apart much better because um, what you can see is that there really is something about the kinds of images here. They're more indoor scenes. 
whereas OPA cluster two seems to be much more outdoor scenes. And um, I'm not sure we would have completely seen that from the original image that seemed to be driving given the noise in the NSD data. So given some clustering or hint that there was something separate there, you can use BrainDog to really pull them apart even more because it's really finding the optimal images for the signals that we thought were separable. And um, the idea is that we can ultimately use it a lot more to do that. Oh, this is for food clusters, two different food, food clusters. This is what on the left is what NSD images that drove those two clusters separately. And then when you pull them apart, you can see that there's much less saturation in the top group and then a lot more color saturation in the bottom group of images. Um, so you've got colorful versus non-colorful food seems to be a dimension of importance in some ways. Um, okay. So just, I mean, I know I'm whipping through this, but just very quickly, um, clue, brain dive is kind of fun, gives you clues to selectivity of higher order visual regions. Um, and it's using only encoder, it's leveraging the billions of images in a diffusion model. It is very slow. And the images are not always interpretable because you're always just sort of reading tea leaves through our own visual system. Just very, very quickly, two minutes and it'll be done. Um, I'll skip the philosophy at the end. We also have brain scuba. It's a lot like brain dive, except we bypass the whole image diffusion generation part of the process. Because we were using clip as a backbone in the first place, we realized we could go directly from the model weights to captions. So we back background ended it to semantic captioning using brain alignments. So we got scuba out of that. Um, again, it's pretty much the same game we were playing, except now you were taking your representations and you're taking back projecting them into clip and you're just doing a text decoder to give you a text caption for each individual voxel in the brain. And just this is a really complicated map, but it's easy to read. Different parts of the brain down here, um, like EBA or OPA, you can see the semantic relationships in terms of what kinds of captions were, what content of the captions was. So if you look at RSC, for instance, pink, you get lots of things that look like cities or scenes. Um, if you look at EBA, you get things more like bodies and actions, rackets, people. Um, if you if you look at some of the face regions, you get more descriptions of people things in there. Um, the food regions, the yellow regions, you get food, plate, cake, scissors, things like that. So the captioning seems to work really well as well. And the cool thing about that is, of course, semantics are a lot easier to interpret, and you can do some more characterization of that and get some qualitative information. Um, so again, it's mostly a tool at this point. I'm not sure we learn much new from brain school, but it seems really intriguing as a way of doing things. Um, this is just some pros and cons um, about the two different approaches. Um, Andrew claims this week he came up with a breakthrough where he's going to be able to semantically ground and build a compositional model for each voxel as well. So we'll see to be determined what he's doing with all this sort of combining them in different ways. Um, <clears throat> But just very exciting because I think they're all tools that we can use to understand things in a way that heretofore we could not do in visual cortex at this level of granularity at the voxel basis and at the neural base, neuron basis. If you had large scale physiology data between images and neural responses, there's no reason why you couldn't apply it to single neurons or populations of neurons. Um, okay, I had a little bit of philosophy here, but that's fine, we can skip it. Um, it's just wide neural networks are really okay, even though people like Gary Marcus are constantly hand wringing at this point about why they're so dangerous and horrible and don't really explain the brain. Um, I think it's fine. I think we just need to acknowledge that they're not models of the visual system. Anyone who's claiming they are is missing the point. They're tools. They allow us to learn more. The visual system is a complex, multi-layered structure that has lots of different things over evolution that are optimized in all sorts of different ways. These neural networks tend to do single tasks or most best, you know, multimodal tasks. And there's all sorts of things missing from them clearly, let alone things like retinas and um, LGNs and lots of other important parts of the process. So, um, but the fact, of, the fact that they solve similar tasks in equally um, high performing way to the visual system, and then they're able to predict data well, tell us there's something going on from conver convergent evolution. Okay. Um, all right, just quickly, current and future work. We're trying to build more diverse data sets for enabling finer grain analysis of cortical representation, particularly moving to video, which I think is really exciting if we can make video work. Um, again, moving towards the idea of cortical coding more as networks rather than areas. 
And particularly this food thing, even though I didn't talk about it very much, is really exciting because I think food provides a really good case study for looking at the interaction between what's actually a very low, very low visual similarity in the input, but very high constraint in terms of semantic knowledge and how semantics and visual input interact together to build the kinds of representations we see in visual cortex. And that's it. Thank you. Mike, thank you so much for, you know, uh, such um, an amazing talk with um, uh, with so many, you know, new uh, futuristic <laughs> directions. Um, really brilliant. So I want to invite everybody to unmute yourself and let's give Mike uh, a big um, um, thank you. And I'm... Thank you. Uh, and thank you. Oh, that's fun. You? Thank you, Mike. How are you doing with time? Are you happy to take questions? Oh, I'm happy to chat. And I saw Bruno's on. Hi, Bruno. Bruno's an old postdoc and friend. I haven't talked to him for a long time. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Great Sava? talk. Sava? <laughs> yes, Sava. I'm following <laughs> with, uh, with the whole lab here. So thank you. Great talk. <laughs> thank you. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. We're going to be in Europe in fall of 25. I'll let you know. We'll talk about it. Sure, sure. Please visit. Yeah. All right. So, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> the stage is yours. So I want to uh, invite um, uh, everybody, if you have questions, uh, you're most welcome um, to ask. Um, I um, I can start by asking, I mean, you're saying you're talking about videos, but you're not talking about generating videos, but rather seeing what, what, what uh, different regions in the brain are sensitive or also generating videos as uh from brain activity like seeing the you know the action or the um stimuli uh the motion stimuli that would stimulate a region to to the best um extent because i myself am terrified by the sora uh since right. it's been published yeah. it, to be honest the, the, yeah <laughs> the implications of ai in terms of the societal issues, things like Sora and then the deep fakes and things are quite concerning. Um, separate issue. I I think there's also some societal reasons to be very concerned about what it, the impact of AI. I think from a scientific point of view, I think there's a little bit of hand wringing that may be a little bit overwrought, just like it was with neural networks and other kinds of things when the status quo changes. It's it's another tool in our toolkit. You know, doesn't solve everything by a large stretch, but. Um, with regard to video, we're starting with, video models are just coming into play as encoding models. They actually haven't worked very well. The computer vision hasn't figured out how to deal with video and temporal information. They're beginning to. So we're really gonna start probably with brain dissection and maybe some captioning, probably more scuba semantic captioning and try and see what we can understand. But we are going to incorporate a lot of visual dynamics into the brain dissection vocabulary to see if we can capture some of that as well. Um, ultimately, we could use Sora or something like it to try and do that. Whether that's informative at all, I'm not sure. Um, it could be that it would capture some kind of dynamics of a sequence that we wouldn't necessarily see otherwise, but I'm a little less I'm a little more skeptical of that, like the fine of it being useful for fine grains. So it might be a cute trick, but it's not the goal right now at all. Um, we do have, I really want to get video going, not just because I think it's a really interesting area where you can capture actions and social and things in a way that you otherwise couldn't. We have access to a really amazing data set from um, the Montreal group Neuromod, which is, I think it's eight people watch six full seasons of the Friends TV show while in a scanner. And it's a little idiosyncratic. On the other hand, it has the virtue of the backgrounds are fairly stable and it's got a lot of social interaction and eating so in some ways getting at some of the things we think are really important in neural coding it might be the perfect data set and so i'm hoping we'll get to the point i have a new student jacob young working on it that seems to be making some good progress and he's actually got some good prediction for some more simple video data sets and so starting with that um We'll see where we can go, but I think we're probably a couple years away from having really solid video stuff. It's going to be hard. There's all sorts of new, let alone the computational complexity. Wow, really brilliant. Um, 
I also want to ask about, um, I mean, all the data that we have is from uh, people who are basically lying down in the scanner and also seeing some uh, limited visual field. I mean, not to talk about right. the other aspects. Do you think um, we are, um, there are sections in the visual cortex that, or, you know, that we are um, missing? And do you think these models, and also I wanted to ask about the statistics of the images that these models were trained on because they were not based on, let's say, I mean, when people take pictures, they, they don't usually take them from right. the point of view of where the eyes are relative to the world. So right. do you think that would actually bias or make some difference in what maybe our visual system develops like when we have different types of um, input statistics through our eyes? Yeah, um, so I think there's a really good point. One, yeah, the people laying in a scanner, particularly with regard to dynamics and things, is idiosyncratic in all sorts of ways, and we're probably missing, and then the field of view. Um, you know, our idea would be some kind of portable brain measuring device that you could just wear while you wandered around the world. Um, we're a ways away from that, although portable EEG is getting somewhat better. Um, portable MRI is probably a ways away unless Mel is working on it still. Um, you know, um, the, so that that's one thing. So I think that's 100% right. And even if you do, you know, some people have done VR in the scanner where you're wearing a headset, which might improve a little bit, some issues, but it still leaves a challenge if you're not really moving around, you're just laying flat. And so none of your kinesthetic information is available. Um, the, you know, neuroscience is a little bit like astrophysics or cosmology or using these imperfect tools to try and measure things that are far away and you'll never be able to go up and really study directly the way you'd like to. Um, the image data set one is an interesting one. So yeah, um, diversity matters, we know. And so clearly we already have this limited set because no matter how big you make it, it's just camera photos, which are idiosyncratic for all sorts of reasons relative to the visual inputs we get. There are a bunch of projects right now with sort of ecological head cams, including some cool ones with babies. Um, yes. And I think that people are already doing it. And I think there's going to be more of like at least taking a large scale model that has a backbone it's trained on image statistics from these just all these images, but then using the smaller data set that comes from the head cam to fine tune it to make sure that you're capturing some of those statistics well. And there's ways to do that. We know how to fine tune models really well now that you can probably pull things out in a way that um, surfaces the critical features of the sort of more experience of someone walking around and looking in the world. Oh, you wouldn't have eye movement still. That's even harder. Um, but but uh, people are definitely moving in that direction to try and get better statistics. And the AI companies are as well. They acknowledge that the data sets that they're using are idiosyncratic in a particular way. And the next steps might be to build better models by collecting that kind of data. So um, I saw one person ask me to go back to my last slide, but I think they already got okay. off of They're gone. Let me ask you a question. Yeah, you, yeah. you know the DRM paradigm, uh, Dees, Rudiger, and McDermott, uh, where they, they give a, a number of words and leave out some sort of central word. And then they ask mm -hmm. people to repeat the words and they repeat the one that was there. Mm -hmm. uh, if I understand the way you're doing some of the, or some of the uh, MRI was, fMRI was done, was asking people to look at the pictures and have they ever seen this picture before? And when they were repeated, they're supposed to see them or not. You generate pictures which are of the same category and maybe are a better uh, uh, example of the category than any real picture. Would they say that they've seen this before? Would they recognize the picture? After all, the brain should be active right. in the same way as pictures they've seen. Right. And so we're not, we're actually about to start running, not quite that study, but very close to it. Because we don't have the original participants that saw those pictures sure. that we used for all the training. So we can't go back and test their hallucination to see whether or not 
It reminds me of some John Gabrielli studies just in memory for pictures that were similar, where they, they, people mm -hmm. hallucinated remembering a picture they'd never seen. But yeah. we are going to look directly at images generated from our brain dive model to look at how mm -hmm. they actually lead to neural responses and whether or not they're actually better than pic actual pictures from the world that seem to nominally be the kinds of pictures you would typically use. So are they really more optimal yeah. from a neural signal point of view? And we're trying to control for lots of different factors. And the part of the problem is how much data we can collect an hour and a half in the scanner. But that's exactly where right. we're going is to try and understand what it is about these images that's so critical and do they do a better job in certain ways? Yeah. And, and another small question, uh, the things about uh, distance uh, uh, mm -hmm. being mapped across the cortex. I was wondering if it has to do with spatial frequency, that things that are farther away are higher spatial frequency, and if that is what is being mapped. It's possible, but if I remember, spatial frequency is one of the features in the vocabulary. Sure. So if that is correct, then it would have found that. So okay. I don't think that was the case in that particular case, but I'd have to go back and look. But again, that's the cool thing mm -hmm. about brain dissections. You could add that in as a hypothesis and then test it ultimately without collecting new data. Uh -huh. um, Terrific. So, okay. yeah. By the way, thank we are, you. It's very I interesting. I think all of these things are available on GitHub. We've tried to make things as available. Um, and Gabe's been, Gabe in particular, the brain dissecting guy, has been really good about putting things out and making them available. Um, but they they are both computationally expensive and technically a little bit hairy. So, I mean, I've been lucky. Carnegie Mellon's got this amazing computer science college. And so I've got people that can handle that kind of stuff because I certainly couldn't do it. Um, but hopefully people yeah. will use it, you know, that's the goal. We also, by the way, one of the fun things we'd like to do with Brain Dive, which we're probably a year away from, is there's no reason why we couldn't parcel the whole visual cortex into a set of, you know, reasonable regions, some agreed upon set of regions, and then have people be able to submit their own neural data in a given format. You say, here's my voxel responses for these two regions, for these regions, and these are my conditions. And then it could nominally generate the images that it thought were optimal for each of the neural regions and and um, um, conditions that you gave it. So even if you were doing a standard hypothesis driven experiment where you had two conditions you were comparing and you had fMRI data, you could say, well, here's what my GLM found for these, the difference between these two conditions. Give that particular region of the brain that the GLM identifies being significant to the brain dive pipeline labeled as the two separate conditions. And it should give you back the images it thinks correspond to those two conditions, which could be really useful because it could surface something that you didn't even realize was a confound in your conditions or something new discovery, or it could just be kind of fun. So I'm hoping we'll get to the point where people can just submit their neural data in some fairly standard format, you know, and be able to get back pictures of yeah. what's optimal for that neural signal. <laughs> Yeah, Amazing. I think it'll be, I think it'll be a blast if you can get it to work. Amazing. Yeah. So. Um, I wanted to you. say that Welcome there back. are two thank yous in the chat, including uh, Ruthi Kimchi. She said, "Thanks, Michael. Interesting talk. Sorry, I had to leave." And yeah. um, I wanna, yeah, I wanna really thank you so much for joining us and for giving such a great and inspiring talk and providing us with so many future tools uh, for um, for investigating vision and the visual cortex. Really, really fascinating. Um, and here, uh, Bruno is also writing, thanks a lot, Mike, great talk. So yeah, well, thank, thank you, you so for much. Having me. It was, it was oh, fun getting pleasure. to think about all this stuff together and put it together, so I appreciate it. Brilliant talk, really great. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you. Thank Everyone you. be safe and good. And Bye. See you down the road. Yeah.